Good day everyone, Doc Mika here, and I will be discussing a brief introduction to virology, um, do a little bit of a uh, definition of terms, and uh, discuss the historical development of virology through the years. All right, let's get to it. It has been said that the history of human development was defined by three things. All right. Uh, number one would be human conflicts. This would lead uh, different uh, civilizations into um, discovering a lot of things, um, a lot of countries and, and all that. Another thing that affects human development until now would be environmental changes. These are things that we cannot control and we are continuing to see the consequences of the changes in the environment from decades ago. And the last thing that affects our development uh, as uh, mankind globally would be the emergence, the prevalence, and the re-emergence of infectious diseases. Public health has always been the cornerstone of medical health. All right. When we talk about um, infectious agents and uh, public health, laging magkasama ang uh, medical practitioners and humans, veterinary practitioners, and the government. How so? All right. You have a subject for this. It's called epidemiology. But um, we have to discuss uh, infectious agents in whatever form they may be, bacteria, viruses, uh, parasites, fungi, uh, protozoa, because they um, define how we go through our lives and how the public, public's health will be affected by any infectious agent that can infect a certain host, all right? Uh, for example, uh, what we see now, right? Uh, mataas ang presyo ng mga baboy, even uh, some of uh, poultry as well. There is a high price for them because there is uh, not much supply because a lot of the farms, all right, swine farms, backyard or commercial, uh, have been decimated by the African swine fever um, epidemic in our country. That's why we have been dependent on imports. Uh, Luzon has been dependent on um, pork uh, grown from Visayas and Mindanao, wherein there is not that much uh, ASF uh, prevalence as compared to Luzon. So everything is interconnected. That's why it's called One Health. But for this subject, uh, you have a su separate subject for bacteria, separate for parasites, and now we, you have virology to discuss viruses. How different uh, are these microbes from each other? You might have an introduction to their differences and similarities from other subjects. So I would hope that you still retain all those uh, knowledge. But let's uh, describe the size. All right. You can differentiate microbes just by their mere size and how they can be visualized using different imaging techniques. Uh, eukaryotic cells can be visualized by just the eye or with a light microscope. Um, you may be able to see the functional organelles within a cell. Um, bacteria can be visualized by light microscope. However, viruses, as you can see right there, cannot be visualized by light microscope, all right? They can only be visualized by electron microscope, same thing as the other micromolecules that you have discussed in biochem. So what is the difference between a virus, a virion, and a viroid? All right. Viruses are very small, usually less than 300 nanometers, infectious particles. Infectious meaning they can cause an infection. They can prime your immune system to um, mount an immune response when they invade a certain host. Particles. Viruses are not cells, all right? Whatever makes a cell a cell is not uh, present in a virus, so they are particles. They are made up of either a DNA or, or an RNA genome or a nucleic acid uh, content inside a protein shell, which we call a capsid, 
and viruses may or may not have an external membrane which we call an envelope okay we we are going to discuss the morphology and how we classify viruses in the next lecture this is just a introductory definition of terms now a virion refers to a complete virus or infectious viral particle meaning if that virus has an envelope a capsid and a dna nucleic acid um, anything that is missing from that virus you cannot call that a virion anymore if it has all of those components at least those three then that's what you call a virion once uh, this virion attaches to the host cells it sheds its capsid now the viroid would refer to the nucleic material in the viruses that are uh, only referred to certain stages of the replication of this virus okay now i pose to you this question are viruses alive this table summarizes the properties of unicellular microorganisms and viruses these unicellular microorganisms are namely bacteria rickettsiae mycoplasmas and chlamydia so you can see the first property is 300 uh, the size of it all right everything is more than or at least 300 nanometers in diameter viruses are not all right focus on this column right here we're in the usual properties in unicellular microorganisms are absent in viruses they are not capable of binary fission they cannot grow a non-living uh, non-living medium meaning they need host cells for them to multiply they do not have their own metabol uh, metabolism or meta metabolic mechanism all right they do not have their own functional ribosomes to produce their viral proteins they make uh, they make use of the ribosomes of the host cells now they may be made uh, of um, dna or rna but never both which is usually the case for some bacteria and mycoplasmas right so viruses are uh, referred to as obligate intracellular parasites or oips since they cannot live outside a host cell they cannot multiply outside a host cell because they're um made that way and um they're not like bacteria which could multiply on their own right now all viruses are obligate intracellular parasites meaning they take over and maneuver the host cell to do and make um viral proteins and whatever molecule that they need for them to further um spread and cause infection in a host all right so they need that host cell however not all obligate intracellular parasites are viruses you've um you're done with micro one i believe you're also done with parasitology so some bacteria are also unable to replicate outside a host cell that's why you also refer to these bacteria as obligate intracellular parasites now what are these you have your blood parasites ehrlichia anaplasma uh, legionella hepatozone so everything needs uh, uh, those um, oips need a host cell to replicate how do we classify viruses what do we base it on the number one um you know basis for classification of viruses would be the nature of the host cells ano ba yung ini infect ng mga viruses na to. So you have animal viruses, which infects um, animals. That includes us. Uh, plant viruses and also viruses can also attack or invade bacteria. And we have a certain name for that. I believe you already know this. What do we call viruses that infect bacteria? We call them bacteriophages. All right. Now we can also classify viruses based on their genetic makeup or what uh, is contained as their nucleic acid that carries the genes that encodes for their proteins. So they may be uh, DNA viruses or RNA viruses, right? This also um, defines 
which viruses fall under the DNA family, uh, which viruses fall under the RNA family, right? Lastly, viruses can be classified based on the presence of a viral envelope. Remember, a virus is composed of a nucleic acid contained within a protein coat, which is what we call a capsid. Together, they're called nucleocapsid. And some viruses can have an envelope. If they don't have an envelope, they, called na uh, they are called naked uh, viruses. If they are enveloped, um, they are called enveloped viruses. So that is a sh very short, very general introduction to viruses. Um, I will now start uh, discussing the historical development of virology. So how did the field of virology develop through the years? Right? As early as 1500 BC, they were able to see uh, suggestions or implications of um, the clinical manifestations of polio in an Egyptian prince with a withered leg, as you can see on the image on the left. Right? Um, now, that could be anything that could not... That could be not polio, but they treat it as, you know, um, as early as then, there are signs of the pathologic consequences of certain viral diseases. Um, in 2016, they were able to extract viral DNA of a smallpox from a 17th century mummy. And they were, uh, and this was a breakthrough um, event when, when it happened, because that means that these viruses have been developing since you know ages ago and they are still here and how they are able to be extracted from a mummified cadaver is pretty pretty interesting right so as early as then my science now of viral diseases um the earliest uh, pioneer of virology or the study of virology was in 1886 by uh, adolf Mayer, right he first described this certain disease that happens in uh, plants, all right, in the tobacco leaves, all right. He called it tobacco mosaic disease because it causes the leaves to um, uh, develop those lesions, as you can see in that image. And this disease can be transferred. He found out it can be uh, transferred between plants, so it's. Um, he identified that uh, this is an infectious disease um, in between plants. After a few years, Dmitry Ivanovsky um, identified or showed the first evidence of um, the causative agent of the tobacco mosaic disease, which is a tobacco mosaic virus, as a non-bacterial infectious agent. Remember at the time, um, they do not have uh, an idea yet as to what causes diseases. At the time, they have multiple theories about what causes diseases. There is still some on the religious side of things that said that because you do not follow the word of God, that's why you're sick. Some would say that miasma or bad, you know, bad air from rotting organic matter actually causes diseases. That's why there's a lot of sick people in the poor community as compared to the rich community just because of the environment. We, they call that uh, miasma. So they don't know. They're still um, theorizing about, you know, the, the cell theory, uh, Cox postulates, and that is it's around this time. So when uh, Ivanovsky identified that the cause of this disease is non-bacterial in nature, um, it caused a breakthrough. And, but how did he do that, right? He crushed um, the infected leaves, those leaves showing that mosaic lesion, and the sap, all right? Yung pinagkrushan nung leaves, he filtered that through the Chamberland uh, filters. The Chamberlain filter is, is also what Pasteur used. He developed that with Pasteur. Um, and usually, the bacteria will be filtered out. Once you um, put here whatever substance, the bacteria will be filtered out. And the sap 
remained infectious even after passing through the filter. So they figured out that whatever is causing this disease is not a bacteria, right? Um, after six years, Martinez Bejerink showed that the inclusions that he found inside cells can reproduce and multiply in the host cells. All right, they're not just inside that; they're not; they're just not living there. They are multiplying inside those host cells. Um, he coined the term uh, "virus," which is the Latin for poison, because it appears that um, it is poisoning those other plants that causes the disease to spread. Now he thought that uh, viruses are liquid in nature. Right, he thought that it's you know it's because particles is very different to believe back then. Even the idea of cells and bacteria is very difficult to believe then. So it's only until um, Leffler and Frosch discovered um, the first animal virus, which is the food and mouth disease virus, an apto virus to be technical, um, that they identified that it is not liquid in nature. So I'm just telling you stories about how um, virology came to be, all right? Do you need, okay, I, I think all of you are like, oh, there's a lot of names, doc. It's just, mm, there's a lot of names. Do I need to memorize all of those? You're in med school, probably, right? You're in med school. When did you ever not memorize? But will I be focusing on them? Probably not, um, because I research all of them anyway. So I think this is where you have to pinpoint which of them actually made a very important contribution to the field of virology that is relevant to your course, all right? Now, in 1881, Carlos Finlay, a Spanish um, physician, theorized that yellow fever, which is a very much um, it's causing a lot of epidemics all around the world, especially during wartime, right? There's yellow fever, they get, um, we call this, they get pale and then they get jaundice and then they bleed from every orifice that they have in their body. That's why it's called yellow fever, right? And of course, before they didn't know what causes this. Um, they didn't know, um, if it's caused by the climate, is it caused by the mud? Because it's mataas um, ang incidence ng yellow fever sa soldiers, okay, during the war time. That's why a lot of countries also, um, not because they got killed during the battle, but because they got sick um, during uh, those times when they were living outside the, the comfort zones. They're living in that trenches, so to speak. Right now, he theorized this first, but this was this was only proven after a year, when uh, Walter Reed identified that mosquitoes, specifically Aedes aegypti, um, are the disease vectors of transmission for yellow fever and also for other diseases as well. But at that time, it's only for yellow fever. Now they did not know what still the, what still causes yellow fever, but. They just know that uh, you'll get it when you get uh, bitten by a mosquito. It was only 30 years after that uh, Max Thaler, I'm not sure if I am pronouncing that properly, that um, Max Thaler was a able to isolate this virus from a mosquito, I think. I'm not sure, gosh, yeah. Um, and it has to be shown that it can be transmitted by the mosquito in its infectious form, right? Yellow fever virus, the a specific kind of virus is it's a flabby virus. Later, you'll have no choice but to memorize all these viruses anyway. So uh, let's go back uh, after uh, 900, in 1902, Maurice Nicole and Adel Mustafa, more commonly known as Adel Bay discovered the Rinderpest virus, which has been causing high mortality rate in cattle all around the world. They call it the cattle plague, all right? Um, in, uh, call this, Walter Plowright, 
developed uh, a live attenuated vaccine against rinderpest. After a few years, he used a monolayer of kidney cells to culture the virus until it became non-virulent, meaning it cannot cause disease anymore and could be transmitted from one cattle to another, producing lifelong immunity. So that vaccine worked. Um, that led to the eradication, global eradication of rinderpest um, in May 25, 2011. That is uh, announced by the World Organization for Animal Health or OIE, right? In 1915, Twort was credited for discovering a small agent, they don't know what it is, which infected and killed bacteria, all right? The, uh, the, this one is a bacteria, the orange colored one, and those green ones are what we call now as bacteriophages. Um, he didn't know what those are yet. He thought uh, three theories about it, right? He thought that these um, things that you see could be a stage in the life cycle of the bacteria. He probably developed processes like that. Um, number two, it could be an enzyme produced by the bacteria themselves, or it is a virus that grew on and destroyed the bacteria. It is only Felix Durrell um, in 1917 where he discovered this uh, certain microbe that is antagonistic in nature and in function. Uh, to the dysentery bacillus bacteria. So he called it a virus parasitic on bacteria, coined the term bacteriophage. And actually, in 1919, he introduced the idea of using phage therapy. Since a lot of the epidemics are bacterial in nature, and, well, at that time, uh, penicillin is not yet, you know, um, commercially available that you could just buy it from your local drugstore. So he thought that um, why not use bacteriophages, these viruses, to kill the bacteria that's causing the epidemics. So they began injecting um, bacteriophages into people who have a severe dysentery, severe uh, cholera, and such. It was controversial back then, but it proved um, it proved effective since they, you know, they got healed from dysentery. But of course, um, it was frowned upon because he was experimenting uh, a, an experimental theory or therapy in people, right? So it worked, and but it was frowned upon. In 1918, the very famous, very bad, and I think you, if you're keeping up with the news. You always hear Spanish flu, Spanish flu, but what actually happened in Spanish flu? Um, this happened in 1918. This is caused by the H1N1 influenza A virus. I'm sorry about the typo. This is from the family Orthomyxoviridae. Um, and it has, uh, well, statistics are quite uh, inconsistent about it, but they said that they, in uh, this, virus infected 500 million people all around the world and killed from 17 to 100 million people. Now, when we see viruses like this, we ask questions. Are they more virulent? Are they more deadly? What makes them virulent? What makes them deadly? Well, you also have to um, figure out that it's not just the virus characteristics itself that could lead to it being more virulent or it being more deadly. The viral uh, characteristics is just one of the factors. You could also have factors uh, in that country. Do they have the capacity to um, treat these uh, uh, the people who got infected? Do they have the capacity to diagnose before this disease got de deadly? Does it even have a treatment? So you have to play into all those uh, factors before you could actually point out, ah, it killed a lot of people because it's just so dangerous. It's just so deadly. Sometimes it's not. Uh, influenza A right now is not that bad. Yes, it kills people. Uh, yeah, that was a little off. <laughs> yes, it, it still kills a, little, a lot of people, but the breakthrough in flu vaccines have saved lives as well. Uh, Ruska and Nol, 
developed in 1931 the first electron microscope, which enabled a lot of scientists, uh, scientists all around the world to visualize viruses, right? Remember, they cannot be visualized through the light microscope. You needed the electron microscope. In um, 1935, Stanley uh, and Lofer uh, examined the tobacco mosaic virus under the electron microscope. Now they were able to see what it looks like. Um, and in 1939, they were able to identify the different molecules that make up a viral a particle. Right? They separated the virus into protein and nucleic acid. Um, they now know that the nucleic acid uh, most commonly is RNA. Um, DNA viruses are also quite common. You have pox viruses, adenoviruses, and such. Herpes viruses are DNA viruses as well. So with the electron microscope invention, that actually launched a lot of um, a lot of development for um, virology because now they're able to see it. With Adelbrook, he focused on the study of bacteriophages, especially the replication method of bacteriophages. He identified the different stages of viral replication and um, how this uh, replication system um, can lead for some viral genes to be transferred into the host cells because again viruses makes use of the um, metabolic machinery of the cell for it to replicate it also he also said that um, what do you call this? The growth of viruses inside a cell is exponential. One goes in, it could be 300 that goes out once the cell lyses. So again, at that time, they still didn't know that. Now we have a lot of information because of these guys. All right. Now, another epidemic happened in around 1950s. That is the polio epidemic. And in 1952, Jonas, Jonas Salk all right, developed the first effective vaccine against polio. How did he do this? All right, he made use of what we call the Ender Swellers Robbins technique of growing polio virus in cell cultures. Remember, they are still um, hesitant in figuring out, and it's still challenging for them to grow viruses in different cell cultures because a lot of viruses are cell specific meaning a virus that hits your respiratory system and hits your alveoli and your pneumocytes might not fare well if it is inoculated in kidney cells all right um viruses that affect um hepatocytes might not fare well if they are cultured in neurons right so it has a lot of uh technicalities uh to it but um they were able to um, form or to design a polio vaccine. And that also led to the development of a measles vaccine, which is also causing a lot of um, epidemics all around the world. In October 1979, WHO or the World Health Organization announced the eradication of smallpox through the you know, aggressive vaccination program all around the world. Um, in 1983, a certain disease was discovered and was named um, the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, what we call now as AIDS. All right. Um, there are two separate research groups because there is a lot of people showing signs that do not um, fit in any of the already discovered diseases. So there is a U.S. group that researches on it there's a france group that researches on it and um around at the same time they discover this but they first clinically observe it in 1981 they didn't know it yet um and found out that the causative agent for this condition is what we call now as human immunodeficiency virus or hiv which is a lentivirus from the family retroviridae to be clear there is still no treatment for it, only management methods. Um, research uh, about HIV has been booming 
uh, still, they are now able to control the amount of uh, the viral load within you so that you do not, um, you are not infectious even if you are still infected by the virus. So um, we're still looking for that treatment. Now, viral outbreaks in the 21st century, we are not um, strangers to viral outbreaks in the 21st century. We may be ignorant to some of them, but we are not strangers to it. In 2002, SARS happened, all right? And we know that. Swine flu in 2009, MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. In 2012, the emergence of Ebola in 2014. Um, we have long eradicated polio here in, uh, in the Philippines since 2000 yeah since 2000 but it has re-emerged uh in 2019 i blame the dengvaksha uh, issue about it um because a lot of the the consequence of that you know i'm gonna go into this very briefly the consequence of questioning a vaccination program can still be felt until now when we are talking about the COVID-19 vaccine. A lot of people lost confidence in government-driven vaccination programs because of the Dengvaksha issue. Even if that vaccine globally has 99% prevention, um, eff uh, what do you call this, uh, effectivity, you know, efficacy in preventing um, severe, severe disease due to Dengue, but you know politics man politics ruins lives hmm. and uh and last year oh, sorry last last year damn last last year we are hit well along with other countries by the african swine fever which we are now feeling the heat a lot of our colleagues in the swine industry are hurting because of this disease, there's still no treatment. They're still developing vaccines for it. And it's very easy to spread, especially in backyard razors. All right. And of course, we are not uh, strangers once again to the COVID-19 pandemic. This is coronavirus disease 2019 caused by NCOV, uh, what do you call this? Yeah. New Coronavirus 2019. Yep. NCOV SARS 2019. So this is the current um, heat map for the, the cases for COVID-19. Um, COVID-19 is a human disease, so I might not be able to discuss much of it. But I believe this is why virology always is challenging to teach especially now we are in the middle of a pandemic you have a lot of questions about the viruses and as much as i can i will set a lot of things straight <laughs> when we discuss viruses so this is just introduction we have another video coming about viral morphology nomenclature and taxonomy now if it is you know information overload for the first week um yes it is I'm not gonna lie but that is how i say welcome back to school everybody all right i will see you next week for a live zoom meeting if you cannot attend totally fine you could wait for the recording in a youtube uploaded video have a good weekend everyone